That's very true. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I did put in the chat and I can certainly put it again if I need to. Is it, do you see the link in the chat for the first session, the YouTube link there, if anyone needs it? Or should I post it again? We missed one, but we didn't. We've only had one class. What? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I thought maybe we missed one, but we didn't. <laughs> no, we did not. Um, and we're going to put it actually on our Facebook, um, the YouTube link on our Facebook page later today when we're done editing this one. So you can stay up uh, and each week I'll give you the week before on here if you need it. So um, I, I want to thank you for coming back. Gadi, I knew uh, if people came back, that means the first class went really well. So thank you. Um, it, is, it is nice to see everyone. Um, there's Howard and Ruth Mazel Tov to, uh, to both of you on the bottom. It was a pleasure to share this weekend. Thank you. It was um, wonderful. It was it's a special kid. It was really no, sweet. Um, and we are. I mean, you can lower it if you want. We are really ready to uh, to dive in and begin. Uh, Gadi, thank you for being with us. I'm going to throw the spotlight on you, and we'll get started. I'll turn off. Yofi. Uh, thank you very much. I. I do hope that people didn't suffer too much last time. So uh, I don't know, Peter. Maybe these are totally new people that uh, than the ones that came last time. <laughs> you you recognize the faces, so you can. Friends, tell I'm going to ask. I'm going to mute everyone. Mute, I yeah. think if I yeah. do it this way, you can unmute yourselves. But that way, it's all. Yeah, there you can. You can unmute yourselves if you need to. Um, and Gadi, you should not be mute. You are muted. Oh, great. Um, I'm muted. It's okay. So you can unmute if you have questions or put it in the chat, but that way we don't hear the background noise. Thank you, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for session um, number two. Gadi, we're thrilled to have you with us live from Israel. Very good. Todaraba. Thank you. Uh, shalom, everyone, once again. For those who weren't with us uh, last week, my name is Gadi, uh, Gadi Bendov. I live in Modi'in, near uh, between Jerusalem and uh, Tel Aviv. I am uh, worked with uh, Rabbi uh, Riegler many, many, many moons ago, and uh, this is great to be in touch. And I also mentioned my grandmother lived in Brumal, uh, so I have a connection to all of you in the area. I have plenty of family still in Brumal, Havertown, and all those areas. Um, so we talked before last time, two weeks ago, about uh, the Bible and about the connections between uh, the biblical narrative and the modern uh, narrative of both Israel and the Palestinians and the people around us. So the title of, the, of these sessions is the Archaeology of the Conflict. So I try to talk about the things that we found and how they relate to uh, the conflict and how it's used uh, about the conflict. And uh, I think I mentioned this last time, but I, I want to start with that, that uh, archaeology in Israel especially, but in the entire Middle East, but definitely in what we call the Holy Land, and I would include in that uh, Jordan as well, um, is very much uh, connected to politics. And the reason for that is, uh, is two reasons. One, um, it depends who's funding the excavation. Uh, and the other reason is uh, it depends what layer you're interested in finding. So if you can think of uh, something called a tell, which is uh, T-E-L, just like in poker, um, when there's uh, the beginning of a hill and then one of the groups comes back and builds on top and then it's destroyed and another group builds and then another and another and another. And eventually you have an artificial hill built of the different layers of history, and we call that a tell. And in the Middle East, uh, including uh, Iraq, Mesopotamia, uh, Syria, all around the Fertile Crescent going from Egypt, the Nile, to Mesopotamia, you have lots of these tilim, lots of these tells. Uh, by the way, many of them have not been excavated yet. Uh, so when you're dealing with archaeology, a lot of times it's who's giving the money for the excavation. And the other thing is, what layer do you want to stop uh, when you're digging? Or what layer do you want to go through in order to get to the layer that you're interested in? And it just so happens that Judaism is the first uh, religion that uh, sort of we're interested in in the Middle East. And in order to get to the uh, connections to the Israelite and the 
Jewish and the Israeli archaeology of today, you of course have to go through Christianity that came later, and even more complicated, Islam that came even later than that. So to get to the what I call the yummy chocolate layer in our seven layer cake, which is the Jewish stuff, uh, we always have to go through the less tasty layers of meringue and lemon. That's just my preference, but we have to dig through the Christian and Muslim layers. And a lot of times that of course gets us into hot water with a lot of people. So um, just wanted to throw that out there because we're going to talk today about some archaeological finds that uh, are very interesting in the narrative and how they uh, play in to the conflict that we have today. So, Rabbi, I know I messed up last time. Uh, we have to finish at seven, right? Or at one, your time. Yes. Okay, very good. Not at, so, uh, not at, not at seven, because that'd be a long class for us. Correct. At eight. Dinner and my, dinner. my bad. It's great. Um, so, the, uh, the issues we'll talk about today, last time was a lot of here's the story in the Bible and here's what we know about it, the exodus from Egypt and A.B. Baby, this guy Abraham and his uh, wife Sarah and Isaac and uh, Rebecca and Ishmael and all of that. Absolutely no archaeological finds about any of these people, uh, which is an interesting uh, question when you think about it. We know that a lot of these stories exists in other local stories that exist in the Middle East. I'll give you an example. Noah, Noah's Ark and the story of Noah exists in parallel uh, documents uh, in Mesopotamia. The uh, Noah's name is a guy named Gilgamesh. If you've never heard of the uh, Gilgamesh stories, um, you'll read it and you'll say, wow, this sounds really familiar because it's uh, very similar to the story of Noah. Um, all kinds of stories that we know of that are uh, existing in our Bible uh, is very similar in a lot of the different cultures around. Today, we're moving into some real archaeological finds and the connections that we've made between them to the biblical stories. And one of the biggest challenges we have is that the Bible is a document that some people see as history and some people see as a religious text and some people see it as both. And it gets even more complicated when you're talking about the New Testament and uh, the stories over there, because much of that is not historically based uh, almost at all. Okay, let's see, what do we have here? So the archeology span of the conflict, I have my email here as well. I'm happy to put it in the, um, in the chat if you want, and people are welcome to, uh, connect, to contact me if you have any questions later which maybe we won't have an opportunity to talk about. So uh, today we'll delve into the archeology span and we'll talk a little bit more about what is it that we actually found that we can say, yes, this is definitely part of uh, the story of, of the Bible or the story of uh, the people of Israel. And for that, whether or not we have possession or allowed to be in this land. So of course, here's, uh, we started uh, high above. We'll continue and get a little closer. We talked last time about the city of Jerusalem and uh, we got a little closer in Jerusalem and we actually went uh, towards the uh, old city and you can see the area of the old city over here. Um, it's really only one, about one square mile. That's the only, and you can see the very dense area, okay? All of that is really the outline of the uh, old city. And the old city of way back when is not the old city of today. If I'll move it up a little bit, uh, the city of Jerusalem actually started over here. See, there's a, a, the Kidron Valley, a ravine over here, and another sort of valley over here. And this finger that today is outside of the old city walls is really where the city started, and I'll talk more about that very soon. Uh, but really, where the city starts is only about 10% uh, of the uh, area of the city today. And of course, in the middle, you have this area that's uninhabited, which is the Temple Mount, and that's really one of the big sources of the arguments or the conflicts. Um, we went to Tel Dan last week, right? The, the model of the temple, the first temple and Solomon's temple. 
um, over in the north of Israel. So let's continue this week with the, uh, uh, the Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, up on the Temple Mount, which is uh, up here. Now, it's kind of funny because I say mount. I've had several tourists that uh, stood over here, actually, on the Mount of Olives. There's a beautiful overlook over here. And they asked me, so where's the Temple Mount? Like they're expecting Everest or some kind of range of mountains. And the answer is, you know, this is a bunch of hills. Uh, Jerusalem is about 800 meters above sea level. That's, let's say, 2,500 feet. As we say in Israel, zelo big deal. Really not a big deal when you're talking about mountains. So uh, Jerusalem really starts over here in this uh, little area. And what I brought is a few topographical um, ways to understand what's going on here. So really the beginning of Jerusalem is this finger that you can see over here. Okay, there's the Kidron Valley. There's the Tyropian Valley, or also known as the Valley of the Cheesemakers. We don't know why cheesemakers. This is a term from Second Temple period during the time of, the, uh, of Jesus and uh, King Herod. If you've watched Life of Brian, he makes some, uh, Monty Python makes some fun, uh, pokes fun with the uh, cheesemakers, but we won't get into that. And at the top, we have a uh, area called Mount Moriah, which Jews believe is where Adam and Eve were brought down from uh, the Garden of Eden when they uh, commit the original sin of eating from the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And at the top of Mount Moriah is the foundation stone, as in the foundation of the world. That's where they started their life here in this world. Later on, um, a few thousand years later, let's say, um, Abraham is told by God to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, and God tells him to go to the land of Moriah, which is why this area is called Mount Moriah. And that same foundation stone is where Abraham almost sacrifices Isaac. And that, of course, is the brit, the bris, as you call it in uh, North America, the covenant between God and our people, Abraham representing our people, God representing him or herself. And the, our, the uh, agreement is, you guys do as I tell you, and I'll protect you, and I'll uh, help you, and you, you'll be the chosen people. Now, it's funny, because when I tell people that we are the chosen people, then, of course, teenagers, which I have a lot of experience with, are very excited. It's like, chosen, that's, that means we can do whatever we want. And then the answer I give them is, not really. It also comes with a lot of responsibility. And uh, we are supposed to be or la goyim. We're supposed to be the light upon the nations. So that's uh, just sort of, sort of a side note. But later on, when the city of Jerusalem starts on this uh, ridge, um, David conquers the city from the Jebusites. We'll talk a lot about that today. And at the top of, the, of this ridge, he builds, uh, eventually the first temple is built on top of Mount Moriah. And the same place on that same foundation stone, the Holy of Holies, of the temple is built. So let's, uh, we have a couple more of these topographic uh, maps. Um, this is our second temple, less of what we wanted to see. Here's a model of uh, this, uh, by the way, is in the old city in Jerusalem. We don't go here that much anymore. But you can see when David conquers the city, this is the Tyropian Valley. This is the Kidron Valley. And you can see this finger, this ridge. Um, the city is over here, the palace of King David, and eventually at the top is where the temple is built. Now, this is the way cities were built all around the uh, east, uh, the eastern area of the world, the Middle East. Uh, the top part was always where the, uh, the temple was built. What you see over here, known as the Western Hill, Mount Zion of today, and the Jewish quarter of today is also up here. Um, this is an expansion during the time of King Hezekiah, which we'll talk about him a little bit more uh, in depth today. So David, 3,000 years ago, uh, comes to Jerusalem. He conquers the city. How he conquers the city, we'll talk about that very soon. And yeah, here's the, uh, as we said, the binding of Isaac. 
and eventually the angel that stops him from uh, sacrificing his son. Very good. So let's uh, go a little bit farther down here and we'll talk about the city of David and the archaeology that we found here. Uh, oh, we have before that a look at the foundation stone. So this is a building you've seen in pictures, the Dome of the Rock. This is a Muslim temple. We'll talk about the Muslims in a couple of sessions, uh, but they built right on top of this foundation stone. Let's go inside the building. Okay, we're actually going to go inside. This is one of the cool things about these virtual uh, tours, because uh, since the year 2000, no one is allowed in this building uh, unless you're Muslim. So with all of the tourists that I bring around, usually we can't actually go in. So this is a great opportunity to see the beauty of this building, look at all the ornamentation and the beautiful um, decorations inside. Uh, but really the main event in this place is this stone that you can see. Okay, so this is essentially the bedrock, the top of Mount Moriah. Here's a, a picture from above. Uh, this beautiful golden dome that we saw is around this piece of rock that the Muslims believe is sacred to them as well. There's a story about Muhammad going up to the heavens um, for a discussion with Gabriel, Jibril, the angel Gabriel, and they believe that this is the stone that he stepped on. Uh, of course, it's exactly the same stone that the Jews believe is where Abraham um, almost sacrificed Isaac and the same place that we call the foundation stone. So it's complicated because Jews and Muslims believe that this stone is important to both of us. All right, so this is a great opportunity to see this. I've been a tour guide for about 15 years now. I've never been in this building. Uh, some of you who might have come to Israel before 2000 may have had the opportunity to go in here. Unfortunately, not allowed anymore today. I'm still looking for my first Muslim group to be able to go in with them. So maybe now with the Emirates and all those guys, I'll have an opportunity to do that. Uh, so here we are at the, what we call the City of David. Okay, so the Kidron Valley over here, Mount of Olives and the uh, Overlook that I just talked about. Down here is the Valley of Gethsemane. We'll talk about that next session where Jesus and the disciples are hanging out before he's captured and crucified. And up here in this direction is the Temple Mount. But why did I stop here? Because I wanted to show you uh, one of the stories of the time of David. So imagine that the story that I'm telling you is happening on this side of where we are, where we're looking. But I want you to imagine uh, that the story with the visuals of the other side of this ridge. Imagine that the uh, king's palace is up here where the trees are. And one afternoon, David comes out of his palace on his balcony. The uh, wind is blowing. It's a nice breeze in the afternoon. And you can see that he's up at the top and he looks down at these buildings below. And on one of these rooftops that are exposed, he sees a beautiful vision. He sees a naked woman that's doing laundry or taking a shower. The Bible's not exactly uh, forthcoming as to what exactly she was doing there. And he falls in love or in lust. That depends on your take of the story. And he sends his uh, people to find out who she is. And turns out she is uh, a married woman. She's married to one of his generals who's out at war fighting to increase the uh, to enlarge the uh, kingdom of David. Um, that doesn't stop David from calling her in. They have a few dates and after a lot of wine and a few evenings, um, she becomes pregnant. And when she says that to the king, uh, the king realizes he has to cover his tracks. Who am I talking about? Anybody recognize the story by, by now? Bathsheba, Bathsheba. And eventually, long story short, David sends her husband, General Uriah HaChiti, Uriah the Hittite. He sends him off on a suicide mission. Uriah dies, and that paves the way for David to marry uh, Bathsheba. And the son that is born is a guy named Shlomo, Solomon, that's important for the continuation of the story. 
But this is a wonderful place where you can actually see how the buildings are literally one on top of each other. And you can imagine that story taking place right over here in this, uh, in this area. Now, I kept telling you that this is the city of David. Um, do we know that this is, in fact, the city of David? The answer is no. We have not found any archaeological evidence that has the words David or Solomon, for that matter, on it to say this is for sure where David's palace was and where the city of David was. Of course, in Jerusalem, and uh, one of my professors has a wonderful way of describing this. Um, he says that in archaeology, you like to infer things quite a bit on different findings. Uh, it's sort of wishful thinking. And nowhere in the world is this wishful thinking working over time as much as in the city of Jerusalem. Because we really, 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 really want the stories of the Tanakh, of the Bible, to come out of the ground and for the archaeology to support these stories. So we're looking at uh, what we call the uh, archaeologists and the historians and the tour guides, and we, what we call the stone-stepped building. There's some kind of big monumental building here. There's, uh, here's one of the walls. Um, here's a, uh, a watchtower that's connected to this uh, wall. And below it, you can start seeing um, local buildings. This is a house. We know that it's a model of a house that's used during that time period. There's two pillars here, and there would be a rooftop. And out here where this wooden terrace is, would have been the rooftop of the house below. And this would have been the yard of this house. And down below it would have been another yard. And just like we saw on the other side of the ravine uh, in the scene before. So how do we still assume that this is the house of David? This is the uh, uh, city of David. Because we know that this is the city of Jerusalem because of the spring of the Gihon, which we'll talk about very soon, the spring of Jerusalem. And we know that this is a huge building, or huge, as my son likes to say, with a C, uh, meaning that this is probably where a big king or the palace of the ruler would have been. So we assume from that that this is, in fact, the uh, city of David. But as I said, Nothing here that says David, which plays into our rivals in terms of the narrative. The Palestinians and the Muslim world, in some way, is saying, you guys are calling it the city of David, but there really is no David to show anybody that it's really that correct place. By the way, the Christian world is involved in this argument as well, because they believe in the Old Testament, because the basis of the Christian Bible is the Jewish Bible. And I mentioned this last week as well, the Quran actually has all of the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament in it as well. Muslims believe that all of the people that came before Muhammad were minor prophets. Muhammad is, of course, the main dude, and he's the guy who got it right. But all the rest, Moses and Jesus and David and Solomon and Paul and... Uh, Peter and all of those guys are minor prophets, and they're mentioned in the Quran. Um, so this is, as I mentioned, the area of the city of David, and perhaps this monumental building. Let's see if we can see it from the other direction. Maybe it'll give you a better view. Here you can see the stone-stepped uh, building over here. We'll come up here a little bit more. It'll give you a better angle. Okay, so this we believe is part of the palace of King David. Now, what, what did we actually find? So in layers above it, we found these little, uh, we call it a bula, which is about the size of a dime. And here's an example. This is, of course, much bigger. But we found uh, these bula that are um, basically little pieces of wet clay that was placed on a scroll, just like you put a stamp with your name in the cover of your book so that people know that it's yours when you lend it to a friend. Uh, imagine a scroll that's rolled up, and at the edge, there are three points where they put a little bit of clay, and then there's a stamp with this engraving that somebody put in, and then it dries up, it holds the scroll together, 
and you know who the scroll belongs to or who sealed the scroll. So this scroll specifically belongs to a guy named Gmariau ben Shafan. Now to most people, you've never heard of him. I've never heard of him until this was found. But when you open the book of Jeremiah, there is an advisor to King Zedekiah, who's the king during the time of the prophet Jeremiah. And one of these advisors, believe it or not, is Gmariau ben Shafan. This is awesome. We found a name in the archaeological finds that exists in the Jewish Bible. It's not David, so a few centuries later, but it's definitely archaeology that supports the story of the Bible. In addition to that, this is recent. Um, the previous Bula we found, I think, 10, 10, 15 years ago, we, the archaeologists. This one was found about a year ago. And this is really cool because it says here, you'll have to trust me because it's in ancient Hebrew. Um, it says Hezekiah, king of Judea. So we found actually a bula or a stamp that carries with it the name of King Hezekiah, who's a big shot in the biblical stories. We'll hear about him very soon. King Hezekiah is somebody we know of. We know of his stories from the book of Chronicles as well as from the book of Kings. And uh, this is his seal. What's interesting is that this is an animal. It's uh, Egyptian. And we know that King Hezekiah made a deal, a pact, with the Egyptians against the Assyrians, against King Sennacherib. The name will come up very soon once again. But these are artifacts that are found here in the city of David that support the biblical story. So if the palace of King Hezekiah is here, it stands to reason that the kings before him uh, lived in that same area, and therefore this is the city of David. Another really cool thing that we found was this uh, shape, uh, capitals, pillars of uh, uh, capitals of pillars, and we know that this is a shape that was used by the kings of the house of David. Uh, we know from descriptions and from other archaeological finds. And this actually was found right above the monumental building, right above the stone step building. And this might look familiar to you because if you've been to Israel and if you've used our uh, shekels, our money, this is a five shekel coin. And look at the back of the coin. Uh, we're trying to use this as a way. And again, this is how archeology span and politics are related. It's not by chance that the Israeli mint decided to use this on our money. We want to connect to the biblical narrative of the Jewish people to show we are the people who came back to our ancestral land where our ancestors lived before. So what better way to do that than to connect your archaeological finds? Um, by the way, it was done since the beginning of Israel. There's lots of coins and money that have archaeological finds that are connected here. Okay, so whether or not this is the city of David, I'll leave for you to decide, but we do call it the city of David. From Jerusalem, we're going to go to Lachish, and Lachish, unfortunately, is not a place that a lot of people go to. Rabbi, have you guys ever gone to Lachish on one of your uh, tours to Israel? Um, it's a beautiful archaeological site, and what's really interesting about it is that it's excavated uh, more and more in the last few years. Uh, they're actually building a visitor center down here that um, should be open in the next year or so. And what we found here is a beautiful tell, remember the layers of the archaeology, that is, uh, first of all, you can see all around the Shfela, the low hills area in uh, its south of Jerusalem and a little to the west. Jerusalem would be in this direction uh, over here. And it's a city that was part of the kingdom of King Hezekiah, 700 BCE, 2,700 years ago. David is 3,000 years ago. And King Hezekiah um, knows that the Assyrians are coming. And King Sennacherib of Assyria, capital of Nineveh, uh, conquers the northern kingdom. I told you two weeks ago that the 12 tribes of Israel, after David brings the capital to Jerusalem, 
David dies, Solomon takes over. They both rule for about 40 years, according to the Bible, the Book of Kings. And when Solomon dies, his son, Rehoboam, you probably never heard of him because he didn't do a very good job. Uh, Ten of the tribes say, we don't like you as a king. You're raising taxes. You're doing stuff we don't want you to do. And therefore, they broke off. They appointed one of their generals, Jeroboam, Yeroboam ben Avat, as the king of Israel. And the kingdom splits into the northern kingdom, kingdom of Israel, ten tribes, and the southern kingdom, kingdom of Judea, centered in Jerusalem, uh, the tribes of Benjamin and Judah. The Assyrians come about 200 years later. They conquer the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and they exile the 10 tribes and they disappear into the woodwork. That's why every now and then you hear about the 10 lost tribes of Israel, that some group of people in India say that they're descendants of the tribe of Menashe or the Irish. This is true, true story, claim that they're descendants of the tribe of Ephraim, Ephraim. Um, the Ethiopian Jews, uh, the Ethiopians in Ethiopia, claim that they're connected to the tribes of Israel. So there's all kinds of, we don't know what happened to those 10 tribes, um, but the story of the southern kingdom continues thanks to King Hezekiah that prepared for the arrival of King Sennacherib with the Assyrians after they destroy the, the northern kingdom and exile the 10 tribes. King Hezekiah it says in the book of Chronicles, as well as in the book of Kings, fortifies Jerusalem. We'll go back soon to see the fortifications in Jerusalem. And he fortifies the cities in Judea, including Lachish. Lachish was the New York City of this time period. Jerusalem was the Washington, D.C., or the Jerusalem of today. And Lachish was the Tel Aviv, or the New York City, of this time period, the economic uh, center, commerce, it's on the trail on the, on the um, um, Via Maris, the road that moves trade from Mesopotamia to Egypt, and it's a very, very successful town. Uh, when I say city back then, I'm talking 20,000 people, maybe, at most. Sennacherib understands that Jerusalem is the most important city, and he comes to the cities in the low hills first, including Lachish, captures them, and then moves up to Jerusalem, where he faces King Hezekiah, and eventually will tell that story very soon. So in the excavations, we actually found a ramp. You can see it here. Underneath this walkway, we found some of the ramp that was built by the Assyrians to lead up to the gate, which is this area over here. And doing this, they literally paved this uh, ramp. They could bring war machines and siege machines and battering rams and all kinds of really cool stuff that uh, in about three sentences are described in the Tanakh. But not only did we found really cool stuff in this uh, uh, tell over here, that is largely not excavated yet, but the stuff that we did find was Assyrian arrowheads, coins, um, lots of, uh, of um, clay material from the right time period. And to top it all off, we found in Nineveh, which is an area in Northern Iraq, that unfortunately the ISIS um, fighters blew it up at some point a few years ago. Uh, a lot of the uh, relics and the reliefs there were destroyed. But the British in the 1920s took a lot of that archaeology and brought it to the British Museum. I used to be very angry about that because it should have stayed where it belongs. But nowadays, I'm thinking it's a good thing the British and the French took all this stuff uh, to their museums. Otherwise, we would not have it. So here's a short film that I want to show you uh, that talks about these reliefs that were found in the palace of King Sennacherib in Nineveh. And they depict, believe it or not, the story of the conquest of Lachish. We actually have a cartoon of the Battle of Lachish and how Sennacherib was able to take it over, which is a great way to connect the Bible 
and the story with uh, actual archaeology. The previous videos showed King Sennacherib's decisive and you guys hear? Assyrian expansion. The we king was also constructing a palace without rival at his capital city, Nineveh, where he chronicled his battlefield successes. Now, all of this is on display in the British Museum Between in London. and 690 BCE, Sennacherib enlarged his new capital city and built palaces and temples. We're going to skip and these exact parts. Math, Here we during go. During which prisoners, deportees, and captured goods are being brought before the enthroned king. The scenes are carved as if seen from the neighboring hilltop where Sennacherib strategically built his encampment. While Sennacherib oversaw the destruction of Lachish, his representatives left for Jerusalem in Isaiah 36. Hold on, hold on. I made a mistake here. Here's where we're supposed this to start. Siege, here and Sennacherib's successes are recounted on stone and clay cylinders and prisms found at Nineveh. So Sennacherib essentially describes to everyone who comes to visit Assyrian him in his palace and all of his conquests. Evidence. Here, rows of Assyrian archers, slingers, and spearmen move toward the city. Lachish. Lachish is situated on rocky terrain and depicted with a double set of walls with turrets and battlements with square windows. All these features have been verified through excavation at Lachish itself. As townspeople flee the city down the roadway leading from the town gate, Lachish is attacked by Assyrian siege engines and ramps. This huge ramp has actually been found against the walls of the ruined city. We're not going to see the whole thing, but I wanted to show you that we actually have an outside of the Bible uh, evidence of the story of Lachish, which brings us again to is the Bible true or not? And we definitely know that Lachish was conquered. We found that ramp that I just showed you that we know in the from the relief. So this is a great place where the story of about 200 years after David we know that this actually happened. A few other places where we have mention of the story of uh, the Tanakh, of the Bible, is this stela, uh, or steel. This is the Mesha steel, or Mesha stela. Um, it was found in Jordan of today, and it talks about Mesha, king of Moab. Moab. We know Moab from the story of Ruth in, uh, in the Tanakh. Uh, Mesha, king of Moab, lists here in this uh, stela all of his victories. And what's interesting is that in his victories, he talks about the king that exists in Judea, right across the Dead Sea from him. Um, and he mentions the king of uh, Judea that exists uh, over there. He actually beat him in war, which is why the words are mentioned here. Now, what you see here is a reconstruction in the museum. The black parts were reconstructed. The uh, lighter color is what was actually left because it was found by Bedouins, uh, by locals in 1864. Unfortunately, um, it was then broken and used for construction because they didn't think that this is important. And eventually the pieces that were found is only these pieces of actual stone. We're in luck, though, because in 1864, there was a European traveler that the locals took him to see this thing, and he was very smart. He took some parchment paper and actually copied it, just like we do with the kids when you put a coin or something underneath and you sort of go with a pencil. So he made an imprint of the entire Stella, which is why we were able to reconstruct it in the museum and we gave us the entire story. Otherwise, only these small pieces would have been found. This is what we still have today in the 20th, in the 20th century. So this is another uh, mention of biblical names. And last but not least, there are a few others, but this is the most important um, uh, stella or um, basically a sign that's placed in the city or at the entrance to the city by the king to say, hey, look at me, I conquered these places and I beat these kind of kings. This was found in Tel Dan, excavated by the Hebrew Union College uh, excavations. And this is written in uh, ancient Hebrew. It's the king of um, uh, Chazael, the king of Aram, 
who controlled that area at the time, says here that he beat these kings and those kings. And one of the kings that he mentioned is Yoash Levet David. Yoash of the house of David. And the word David is, uh, I'm circling it here, it's uh, sort of highlighted over here. That's David in ancient Hebrew. The only place outside of the Tanakh, of the scriptures, that the name David is mentioned. So this is a big deal. This is a big find. It's not mentioning David. It's mentioning a descendant that's a king that's from the house of David. So this is very important because it shows us that David did exist. Whether or not the palace that we found in Jerusalem is his palace, that doesn't give us evidence to that yet. But I won't get into it, but there's an entire school of thought that believes that David and Solomon didn't actually exist, but rather they were made up by the Israelites who came back from Babylon. I'm skipping ahead. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, because they wanted to glorify their kings, but that the real David and Solomon are King Omri and King Ahab of the kingdom of Israel. You have homework. Look it up. Go to uh, Kings 1 or 2 or Google and read about King Omri and King Ahab, and you'll see that their stories are very similar to the stories of David and Solomon. More about that uh, maybe next week or in another session. Uh, so these are the important, here's the uh, inscription, and David is uh, right over here. This again is ancient Hebrew. Okay, moving right along, let's go back to Jerusalem because Sennacherib destroys um, Lachish. And in the relief that we found in Nineveh, it actually says that he conquers these cities in Judea, including Lachish and then he held King Hezekiah like a bird in the cage. And we know that in the uh, archaeology, we know that King Hezekiah survived the siege of, uh, of Sennacherib. And how did he do that? By doing two very important things in Jerusalem. He knew that, those, that the bad guys are coming because Sennacherib conquers the northern kingdom and then goes to Lachish, and then comes up to Jerusalem. We're not talking about a few days. All of these movements take months, if not years. So the people of Jerusalem are preparing, and what they did was two very important things. One, they reinforced the walls of the city, but the most important thing that Hezekiah does is he carves a tunnel out. Here, I'll show it to you over here. He carves a tunnel known as Hezekiah's Tunnel. These are the walls of the city. Here's the spring that's outside of the walls. He carves a tunnel that brings the water underneath the ridge, underneath the city, eventually into an area that's inside the walls. And that way the water source of Jerusalem is inside the walls protected and the siege of the Assyrians, King Sennacherib is unsuccessful. Here's another uh, way of looking at it. Yes, no, I didn't bring it. Anyway, how do we know that this tunnel that we found and it exists today, we fondly call it the water park of Jerusalem because it's a really great place to go in, especially in the summer when it's nice and hot outside. Um, the spring still functions, the water still flows in that tunnel. Uh, and this is a plaque that was found inside the tunnel and it's a little hard to see, but there's Hebrew writing over here. And here's what it looks like in, uh, in black and white. And it says on it in ancient Hebrew, this is the tunnel that was uh, carved by King Hezekiah. And we started from two ends. And eventually one day we heard our friends carving from, or uh, uh, not carving, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, digging from the other direction, and eventually we rejoiced because we met and the tunnel meets on both sides. So here's an actual description of a story of a place that we know that is mentioned in the Tanakh that King Hezekiah created that still is there today. And not only did we find the tunnel, we also found an inscription that says that this is from the time of King Hezekiah. 
amazing. Unfortunately, the original engraving is in Turkey. In uh, the Ottomans saw what the British uh, are doing in other places and uh, wanted to do that too. Uh, so this is in the museum in Istanbul. Uh, it's interesting, there's some arguments between Israel and Turkey even today about trying to bring that back to be displayed in the Israel Museum because it technically belongs to the state of Israel. But this tunnel is a very cool place. And I have a video that'll show you a little bit about it. How are we doing with time? Excellent. Um, so let's watch a short video about Hezekiah's tunnel. And we'll then have a 45 second uh, video that I found of a family walking through. And it's really funny because the water's cold and it's dark and it's a lot of fun. Again, we're talking 701 BCE, 2,700 years ago. All right, come on. And here you see how the tunnel goes underneath the city, literally, right? This is the ridge of the beginning of Jerusalem, the Jewish quarter of today, the Western Hill, from the spring underneath to an actual pool. This is talking about the original irrigation that the locals used to use. They basically had a channel that brought water for the valley to uh, irrigate the fields. Here's the same relief we saw before from Sennacherib. Okay, in the Book of Chronicles. Let's move forward a little bit. Here's that moment that the the Diggers are getting to uh, see both sides. Very good. So let's see the next uh, video, which is kind of fun. Um, when you walk through this, it's pitch dark. There's no light. You have to bring your own flashlights. Um, it's not for the fate uh, of heart. It's not uh, for people who have uh, little claustrophobia issues. Uh, single file for about half an hour to 45 minutes in the cold water. Um, it's great, and as a guide, I get to go in there quite a bit. So this is one of the families I was with. They sent me the footage at some point. It's more of the sound effects, but in a minute you'll be able to see a little bit. So the, the water reaches a little bit above your ankles, and there's a couple of spots where it gets to about your knees. Very good, just wanted to give you guys the feel of when you're in there. So one of the funny questions I got not long ago was, uh, um, did the people walk through the tunnel when it was uh, in the ancient times? Like, did they enjoy the water park like we did? And of course the answer is no, because it wasn't a water park, it was source of life, water for them to bring uh, into the city. So, the Assyrians uh, are unsuccessful in capturing the city. They go away. But then in 586 BCE, the Babylonians come in. Uh, they conquer the city. King Nebuchadnezzar destroys the city of Jerusalem on Tisha B'Av, the ninth of the month of Av. The temple is destroyed. 
and our people are exiled to Babylon. Now at this point, we are called Jews, not Israelites, because remember, the Northern Kingdom disappeared, 10 tribes disappeared. It's no longer the entire 12 tribes of Israel. We're now only the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, which is why the descendants that are left in Jerusalem when the Babylonians come in are descendants of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. Therefore, we are descendants of those people, which is why we're called Jews and not Israelites. Okay, so uh, we go to Babylon. There we uh, write some songs and we uh, start singing on the rivers of Babylon. We sat, okay, so on the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we remember Zion. And eventually Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and Nehemiah, the administrator appointed by uh, King Cyrus, the um, Persian king, allows our people to come back and we rebuild the temple, that second temple version 2.0. It's a very meek, kind of not exciting uh, temple. And um, that's 536. Cyrus is a Persian king that allows all of his uh, subjects to go back to where they live, not just the Jews. We actually have the Cyrus Declaration. It's a cylinder. It's about a foot long and about uh, uh, 12 inches wide. And on it in uh, Akkadian, in the writing of the time, it says that all of the people are allowed to go back to their place. So this again is something that archeology span supports the story. Uh, so that goes until 332 when Alexander the Grape takes over the area. He has a big grape on his head. Just kidding, Alexander the Great conquers the area and it becomes Hellenistic. And somewhere in the middle here between 332 and 63, in the year 167 BCE, we have the story of Antiochus IV, the Greek king that imposes taxes on the uh, Jews. He forces them to sacrifice unclean animals at the temple. He forces them to put a statue of himself in the temple. And that causes a group of people living in the town that I'm living in today, Modi'in, to rise up against them. Who am I talking about? The Maccabees, right? The story of Hanukkah. And that's where we're going to end today, because that brings us to the beginning of the Second Temple period, which is the Romans and King Herod and Jesus of Nazareth and Christianity. And we'll talk more about that uh, in the next session. All right, questions. Everyone's still alive over there, breathing, <laughs> doing OK? We're great. That was a, a lot. So we have to, un we have to unpack it. Um, I will say, if you want to watch it again, I'll make sure that I have the link for you uh, next week. I'll keep updating you. And on our Facebook page this afternoon, you should see classes one and two. But Gadi, well done. I don't know if anyone has any questions or thoughts. Yes, Rabbi, I have a question. Gadi, how many layers did they have to go down to reach what is thought to be David's city? So it, we believe that in Jerusalem, there are 27 different layers, 27 different groups that came through and conquered the city and rebuilt on top and so on. Um, sometimes you see a layer of destruction, as we call it, where you can see that the city was leveled and burnt, usually is how you know that. Um, so how many did we go through to get to David? It depends where you are. Um, as I mentioned, the city of David is actually outside of the old city of today. So from about the Greek period and the Roman period, 2,000 years ago, um, the area of the city of David was less uh, important until during the Crusaders 900 years ago, it was completely ending up outside of the city. So that area, we didn't have to go through a lot of layers over there uh, okay. because the Muslim period and the uh, uh, the people that came uh, around 1500 years ago didn't really care about that area. So that area is a little easier, but when you get to the Temple Mount area, that's where it gets really complicated because there it built up during the different uh, generations. 
Um, so I don't know the actual answer to your question, but, yeah. uh, but it's a lot less that we needed to excavate um, compared to the Temple Mount area where everything is there. Um, I also just received a question in the chat. Uh, was first and second, just an easy question for you quick. Were the first and second temple built on the same spot? And was there a temple on Mount Moriah? Yes and yes. Mount Moriah is uh, the same name for the Temple Mount and the same place that the story of Adam and Eve, binding of Isaac, was the same stone that the Holy of Holies was built on top on both temples and all of the versions of the second temple because we just covered version 2.0, which is Ezra and Nehemiah. You have Hanukkah, which is probably a new version and you have King Herod, which is an additional version and we'll talk about that in the next session. So just a couple of quick uh, things. First of all, Gadi, thank you for another wonderful yes. session. My pleasure. Uh, to much, much learning that we have left to do together. Um, the um, I will say to everyone, start saving your shekels for our next Israel trip. We will yeah. we will return. We will be back. We promise. But uh, God willing, it will be it will be soon. It's not on the calendar yet. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to remind you um, that Sarah Hurwitz. Um, a former speechwriter for Michelle Obama, who wrote the book Here All Along, a reintroduction to Judaism will be with us next week. And Tuesday night of this week, we'll be sharing a book review and discussion. If you haven't read the book yet, um, even if you can't do it for this week or for next week, it's really worth reading as an in-depth look at what Judaism has to offer. It's quite lovely and she's really a gifted writer. And I look forward to meeting her and spending time with her next week. Um, the links for the first class and now the second class will be available later today. And uh, I think that is all. Have a wonderful day, everyone. You too, Rabbi. Say Shabbat Thank Shalom, you. but we're not quite there yet. No, not yet. <laughs> Thank you, Gadi. Have a good Thank day. You, Thank you, Gadi. everyone. Wow, you even Bye. finished on time. That's pretty good. I'm nice. impressed. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. See you in two weeks. Thanks, okay, Bye -bye. good, good. Toda.